Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to Pacific Whale Foundation's first ever Google Hangout. Uh, this is part of the Maui Whale Festival's Weekend with the Experts. Today I'm joined by an amazing group of panelists and we're going to be discussing the topic of whales and dolphins in captivity. If you'd like to ask our panel a question during the event, you can do so by clicking the Q&A tab on the top of your screen or by using the hashtag PWFExpert on Facebook and Twitter. My colleagues Jessica and Jens are working alongside me to review your questions and update our social media feeds during the chat. Please feel free to follow at Pacific Whale on Twitter and like Pacific Whale Foundation on Facebook. We are posting this hangout online on Pacific Whale Foundation's YouTube page in case you couldn't join us live or if you'd like to watch it again. So I'm going to start by asking my panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Dr. Right, Rose, well, yeah, first. I'll go first. Uh, I'm Naomi Rose. I'm the Marine Mammal Scientist at Animal Welfare Institute. And uh, I've been working on this issue for a long time, about 23 years now. Okay. I'll go next. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samantha Berg. I'm, a, um, I'm a, a, one of the cast members from Blackfish. I'm a former SeaWorld trainer. And I got involved in this issue since uh, in about February 2010, so after the trainer was killed at SeaWorld in, in Orlando. Okay. And we also have John Hargo. Um, and it's John Hargrove, and I'm a former senior killer whale trainer uh, from Seawater, Texas, Seawater, California, and Marineland in the south of France. And when I left Seawater, when I resigned in 2012, I was interviewed for Blackfish and hung out, hung out with all these great guys and also uh, got involved in all the active legislation that's pending, all the, the bills that are on the table right now, and then I also uh, wrote a book called Beneath the Surface that was published this past March. And um, yeah, I'm working closely with um, everybody else on the panel that you see today. We're, we're working hard on a lot of different issues. Okay, and last but not least. Yeah, I'm uh, David Nywert. I'm the author of, of Orcas and Men. I'm based in Seattle. I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, in my day job, I write for the Southern Poverty Law Center. And uh, but I've been writing about killer whales for about uh, 25 years now, and uh, I'm grateful to be included with this August group. So, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. We're very happy to have you all today. Uh, so, I'm just going to dive right in. We have a lot of questions that were submitted online. We had a lot of interest in this event, so I'm going to try to get to everyone's questions. Um, but let's just start out with uh, the topic itself, whales and dolphins in captivity. So why do you believe this is an issue? Why shouldn't marine mammals be in captivity? Well, I'll start that just because I've been doing this so long. Um, I think that the issue was uh, controversial, you know, maintaining these wide-ranging large predators from the marine environment in swimming pools, basically. I think it was controversial from the start. Uh, it started uh, in the modern era in the uh, 1930s for dolphins um, in Florida and then started for uh, killer whales or orcas in the 1960s in California. And I think from the very start people were protesting and picketing and that sort of thing, but not very widespread. It wasn't a very widespread protest. Um, and so basically since the beginning um, people have been saying this isn't right um, and it's kind of intuitive that it's not right. Um, and so as information has um, increased, we've, we've learned more and more about these animals in the wild, and we've um, accumulated more and more information about what has happened to them in captivity. It's now just reached the tipping point, in my opinion, and blackfish uh, played an enormous role in that. So I'd like to add something to that, that I came to, um, I came to working with animals in captivity from an animal science background. I have an animal science degree from Cornell University, and I was working with domestic animals like cows and horses and pigs. And my perspective when I started working at SeaWorld was that if we gave these animals everything that they needed, if we fed them, we took care of them, we gave them love, and that if the public was somehow benefiting from their presence in marine parks, that that was an okay trade-off. 
And what I've seen, especially from all the time that I've spent working with Naomi and all the info that information that's come out since Don Branchow's death in Orlando, it's really clear that we can't meet the needs of these animals in tanks and that the public is actually not gaining anything from having them in captivity. In fact, we may be going backwards from people seeing them in captivity performing tricks. In fact, it's likely that we are. So um, wh whereas I came to the... Um, working at a place like SeaWorld thinking I was doing something good and positive and I was proud of my experience being a SeaWorld trainer. Now I'm actually embarrassed that I, that I chose to do that right out of school and I wish that it was something that I, I wish I'd actually chosen if I was going to work with animals I should have really gone and worked with them in the wild. So um, and it unfortunately took having to see what I was doing there, really take a look at it from, um, from a different perspective and not just from the perspective that the marine parks try to, to give to the public about what a wonderful thing they're doing because they're teaching little kids about animals by seeing them in a little, in a little tank doing, doing tricks. David, do you want to go? Sure. Um, yeah, my perspective is mostly from working with the animals and seeing them in the wild, although part of my journey includes, you know, going to SeaWorld and, and Miami Seaquarium, yeah, you know, I took my daughter there when she was quite young, and I write about that in the book. Um, you know, and so a, a lot of what you actually experience when you see the animal in the wild is the, uh, the very stark realization that they do not belong in these tiny little tanks. When you see an animal that's swimming constantly and swimming 100 miles a day, it doesn't take much logic to figure out that, you know, what you're, when you're seeing them in these tiny pools, you're seeing something really profoundly wrong. And children sense it. Uh, my daughter sensed it. Um, and grown-ups sense it. It's, it. it's a very intuitive thing, actually. And, and then when you study, uh, it, you know, it, of course, SeaWorlds and all, all the marine parks throw up a lot of, um, feel good stuff about how they're supposedly helping children, but uh, we found that you know what sh what my daughter learned at SeaWorld was was just piffling. It was you know sort of a caricature of the animal, and she learned so much more about them seeing them in the wild, you know, because there you're seeing the real thing, and you know it's also a lot cheaper to see them in the wild. I should mention so. Well, you're not, you're not paying a hundred bucks a pop to to get in the park. Um, uh, for me, you know, this was a childhood dream of mine since the age of six, and I went into it with a open heart and a naive mind, believing that these animals just lived perfect existences, and um, I would live happily ever after, and they would never be suffering. Why would they be suffering from any type of health ailment or anything like that from captivity? But from what my career taught me and showed me throughout the years was that unquestionably these animals are not thriving in captivity. They're not even surviving and um, it takes a long time when you've invested so much into your identity and your childhood dream to even once you see these things that are not right you try to rationalize them away because you still want that life. You still want those relationships with those whales until you can no longer rationalize it away anymore because you have seen so many grotesque and horrific things that happen to these animals in captivity. And that's what happened to me. A lot of things happened at once. Alexis Martinez was killed. My friend Don Branchaw was killed. I had been fighting management for years over artificial insemination and the separation of mothers and calves and it all just kind of came to a head and I just could no longer justify being in this environment and seeing what happens to these animals when they're in captivity. I understand why people want to see them. They're magnificent. They're beautiful. I get it. That's the whole reason why I wanted my career. But if people understood what truly happens to these whales, for you to have a fun day at SeaWorld, they would never visit. And SeaWorld hides all that information from the public. Okay, so here's a question that was submitted online by Michelle from New Jersey. She asked, why didn't the former SeaWorld and other marine park employees speak out about against orcas in captivity until the movie Blackfish brought the issue to public? Can I start that, please? Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, 
we spoke up way before Blackfish came out. It might not have hit on to uh, to a media level, uh, but I know for a fact after sp uh, spending so much time with Sam Berg, Carol Ray, John Jett, Jeff Entry, Dean Gomersall, uh, we had all, while we were trainers at SeaWorld, had fought management on various issues and had spoken up and were thus uh, punished for it, for speaking up. It's not an environment that uh, allows you to challenge the system. Um, but we've been speaking out and fighting for these whales for years. It's just the mainstream public didn't see it until Blackfish and then, of course, the national and international media. So it's not like we just believed 100% in SeaWorld and then magically when Blackfish came out, we changed our minds. There's nothing further from the truth. And I also want to add to what John was saying. I mean, you have to imagine there's not that many people in the world who have trained killer whales. You know, there's probably more, there's a lot more dolphin trainers, but think about how many jobs there are. And once you've worked your way up to a position, like a, a position that John had, you know, you're a senior trainer at SeaWorld and this is what you've been doing for your life. Even though at that point you see a lot of things that you disagree with, you've got a job, you've got security, and if you say anything about the industry, if you try to step out of line while you're working there, it's going to be real. You're, you're going to lose your job and you're never going to get a job in the industry again. And then people who quit who are still trying to work in the animal captivity industry, whether it's even if it's not with killer whales at, at other zoos or, or with dolphins or any or swim at the dolphins programs, you really don't have a lot of options to say what you've been seeing. So if you want to stay in the industry, you have to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and um, and um, those of us who quit SeaWorld who are working other jobs, like myself, I'm an acupuncturist now living in Alaska, and it had been a long time since I worked at SeaWorld. So I was able to start speaking out and not fear that I was going to lose my livelihood or my job. But I know there's people who quit SeaWorld and had only been gone for a few years who wanted to say something but were frankly afraid that they wouldn't be able to get a job in the animal industry and they were just very conflicted because it was it was still part of their identity. There, were, um, those of us, who, um, several of us who were interviewed in Blackfish, it had been a long time since we worked at SeaWorld, and even that, I think it was still hard for us to come to terms with some of the things that we had seen because we still ha believed some of the things that we were told by management and didn't even realize it. That, and I can tell you that um, even though I'd been out for 17 years when when Don Brancho was killed in 2010, um, it was still a process of coming to terms with with understanding the things that I believe that the company told me, the ways to think about animals in captivity that were not true and that I had to let go of those things. So even though I hadn't been working there for 17 years, it was still hard for me to open my mouth the first time and say something. I'll, uh, can I add to that? Um, my, I've got a lot, of, a lot of experience with closed belief systems in my, in my day job. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, SeaWorld uh, really does, and in fact, the whole marine park industry really behaves very much like a cult, uh, where you know uh, you are expected to uh, buy into the dogma, you're expected to absorb the dogma, and, and to not just believe it, but breathe and drink it. And and when people suddenly discover, you know, I mean, there's bound, there are bound to have been over the years a lot of people who have uh, found themselves run up against that closed belief system just as, I mean, it's really comparable to Scientology in a lot of ways, so in the way that they, they punish people who um, speak out in the way they uh, persecute people who speak out. I mean, uh, just look at what they've done to John. Uh, it's it kind of outrageous the the sort of smears that they've attempted to do of his character and, and uh, really of all the characters of the um, the Blackfish cast when when the film came out their primary response was not to respond to the to the factual issues that the that the film raised but rather they they chose to attack the cast members as supposedly being inadequate or inappropriate or extremists uh, and, and Naomi you, you're familiar with that term too. So. Yeah and, and I'll just finish up by saying that um, you know again I've been doing um, handling this issue and working on this campaign for about 23 years and in the, the entire time that I've been doing this um, I've been subject to numerous ad hominem attacks. They go after my character, they go after my credentials, they go after me. 
and I don't care because I never worked there and um, they can't harm me and um, I have my own reputation in the marine mammal science community and I have my own circle of colleagues that is very solid and, and and the bottom line is they can't hurt me. They, they don't seem to get that because they keep trying, but they can't. But they can hurt the trainers. They can hurt people who work there. And, um, th and they do it. it. It's unethical. It's unprofessional. It's remarkable how unprofessional um, this large corporation can be. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I, just saying this out loud to me sounds like, you know, we're just going after SeaWorld and we're being mean and, and, we're, and we're, we're, we're doing the ad hominem attack backwards. But I'm not... I'm not actually naming any names. I'm talking about the corporation as a whole. Um, as David put it, it's a belief system there. It's a closed belief system there. And um, it's always been like that. It's not anything new. It's just now people can see it. It's, it's more public. So, yeah, maybe the rest of you can talk about this. Uh, how has spoken out, speaking out about these issues affected your lives, either positively or negatively? What repercussions have you experienced? You want to go first, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I immediately started getting uh, threatened legally by SeaWorld, so um, uh, they, didn't, they went after me quite hard. Uh, when they knew the book was going to come out, they threatened to sue me, and then uh, they threatened to, um, uh, they even threatened McMillan to file an injunction to stop the book from being published. Of course, uh, none of that ever happened, and the book did get published, and uh, they didn't sue me. Um, and, you know, SeaWorld knows that I um, have access to quite a bit of things that, that would come out in discovery and court that would pretty much put the final nails in the coffin of their business, and I don't think that they want those things coming out in a court of law. Um, but, yeah, as Naomi was saying, and that Naomi has experienced this for so many years, um, and David mentioned it as well, and it's so true, you know, their response is to attack you personally. It's not to address the issues. It's not to say um, they're not speaking the truth in Blackfish, and this is why, and we can prove it. It's these are horrible people. You can't believe them because they uh, did this 10 years ago when it has nothing to do with your killer whale training career or your killer whale training experience or your uh, scientific experience or whatever, it's just the ad hominem, uh, personal attacks, character assassinations to try to d distract from the real issue uh, and pull people away from that because they're desperate for people not to really truly listen to you, but then to also, uh, you know, maybe try to, you know, also try to intimidate you into shutting up, you know, and in the past that has worked very successfully to trainers who did not have a lot of resources to fight back. Um, fortunately, because of Blackfish and because of my book and because of the people that I'm now, um, you know, are a part of my world, I have the resources to fight back and they're not going to shut me up and they know that by now. Uh, but they certainly have tried and uh, they have gone after me quite viciously. But, you know, I knew when I was going to speak out they were going to do this to me because I know them very well. We're like Frankenstein. They created us. We, we knew that they were going to do this to us if we spoke out, and all of us former trainers still chose to, to make that decision knowing what they would do to us, and they all hit us in different ways. You know, they all tried to say various uh, negative things about each of us, whichever what, uh, things that, that they felt that, that could stick. But it, it's so incredibly immature, especially for a multi-billion dollar corporation. It is, it is quite amazing that they get away with these, uh, these childish playground personal attacks and name calling uh, and in not even addressing the issue of the welfare of orcas in captivity. And, and if I could just jump in for the whole group here, I would like us to get back to the issue, which is orcas in captivity, because um, I don't want this to turn into, you know, like a a bash SeaWorld session, which I don't think we intend to do, but it's very relevant, you know, what is going on at the corporation, but, you know, I think most of the questions are probably going to be about, you know, what is it about orcas in captivity, so if we could get back to those questions, that would be really great from my perspective, thanks. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's discuss why it's a problem to have orcas in captivity. What is it about their biology, their life history, 
that's problematic to have them in captivity. Um, and I'm a killer whale biologist, and um, like David, I've spent a lot of time in the wild with these animals. And it was that experience, seeing them in the wild and then comparing it to what I knew about them in captivity um, way back in the 90s that really started um, my journey uh, to where we are now. And so I would say in a nutshell, and it's really very straightforward. They're too large. They're too socially complex. They're too long-lived. They're too intelligent. And they're too wide-ranging to be accommodated appropriately in captivity. We cannot give them what they need. And it's not rocket science. Um, there is a growing body of science supporting what I just said, but you know it's common sense too. And as David said earlier, I mean, you know, it's not. You know, you, you feel it in your gut after a while of watching these animals swimming in circles. For anybody who's ever been to see Lolita in the Miami Sea Aquarium, that enclosure is um, inhumane. It's not just, you know bad in, in a generic sort of larger picture sense as it is in general with these animals, uh, the species being in captivity. The Lita's tank is particularly outrageously inhumane. It is so small, she can't even hang vertically in the water. That's ridiculous. That shouldn't be something in the, that, that this our society does in the 21st century. We shouldn't take an intelligent animal and stick it in a space where it can't even adopt a natural posture. You know, that's like putting your, and, and SeaWorld loves to do this, they love to compare um, their animals to dogs. <laughs> I don't know why. They always say, that's like, you know, releasing one of these animals into the wild would be like releasing your dog in the forest. Well, let's compare them to dogs. Would you put your dog in a kennel where it couldn't stand up and leave it there 24-7, 365? I think you'd be arrested for animal cruelty if you did that. Well, that's what the Miami Sea Aquarium is doing with Lolita. Well, and, you know, to add to that, you know, uh, SeaWorld with Telecom, most of uh, all but two of hit the pools and the facility at SeaWorld of Florida are deep enough to accommodate his length. So, like Lolita, where the length of her body drags along the bottom because her pool is not deep enough, Telecom faces the same issue, as well as some other orcas uh, in California. Those back pools are only about 18 feet deep, and we have, uh, I say we, SeaWorld, SeaWorld of California, has several orcas that are over 20 feet in length. So it's not just Lolita, it's also Tilikum in Florida, it's also multiple whales at SeaWorld of California, it's uh, multiple whales at SeaWorld of Texas. Um, and the, the things that we saw as trainers, Sam Berg and I, um, were so horrific. Um, uh, I mean, Sam definitely has some examples with... Um, with Gudrun, right? With Gudrun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, you know, I'll let you speak about it. I don't want to take that story, but, but, you know, throughout my career, we would see all of um, the, the manifestations of orcas being in captivity and why they are not suited to be in captivity. Uh, they float motionless for hours at a time. Um, um, sometimes all day at the surface of the water, also referred to as logging. They're eaten up with mosquitoes. Multiple whales have died, in fact, from mosquito-transmitted encephalitis that would not happen in the wild. These whales now are inbred and they are crossbred. That does not happen in the wild. So whales are being created in captivity, uh, not only by SeaWorld, but other uh, marine parks that have uh, killer whales. They are creating orcas that do not even exist in the natural world by inbreeding them and crossbreeding them. Um, we see chronic regurgitation from boredom. We see self-mutilation. We see uh, all the uh, stereotypic board behavior patterns of just swimming and circular motions, the fully collapsed dorsal fins of 100% of the adult males, the grinding down of the teeth, which forces us, the trainers, not the vets, to manually drill the teeth and perform a pulpotomy and then have to invasively irrigate those teeth out. There's just a ho I could go on and on and on. There's just a host of health issues that are clearly evident by these animals being in captivity which prove that they're just not suitable to be uh, captive. And I also want to point out, and what you were saying is that you know SeaWorld also presents itself as a research and conservation um, uh, industry, 
You know, and, but if you look at how those tanks were designed, one of the reasons I left SeaWorld is because my intention was to go back and actually uh, bring some, something new to the facility designs because I actually thought that, they, that SeaWorld could take the facility that they had and turn it into something more. Like in the, in the, in the mid-90s when I left SeaWorld, a lot of zoos were moving into more naturalistic settings to give animals a more... Um, you know, much more space and something that was more like what they would be used to in the wild. But what I realized going through this experience is the tanks are set up that way intentionally because it keeps the animals bored, it keeps them dependent on their trainers, and honestly, if they had, if, if let's say we could build something that was big enough, which would basically take up the entire park and the parking lot at SeaWorld of Orlando, but let's say we could give them the space that would actually be a little bit better for them, then they wouldn't do shows. <laughs> so <laughs> it's actually, it's not in their best interest to have a facility that serves the animals because then they wouldn't be able to do the shows that they do. So I didn't, you know, I didn't, again, I didn't think that through while I was working there, and then Naomi likes to point out, I think, it, what is it, 50 research? research papers in, in, in 50 years. They put out about one research paper a year. And most of their research papers are about how to keep these animals alive and how to keep them breeding in captivity. It does not really, it doesn't benefit the animals in, in the wild at all, but that's what they claim. So I think part of what really gets me is that they're lying. <laughs> you know, they're not doing what they say they're doing, and it's not benefiting the public in the way that they say that they are. So, you know, on top of everything else, it's it's not like these an it's not like this is a worthwhile trade-off. All the suffering that John just talked about, it's not like we're getting any benefit from it. This is just a corporation that's making money off of these animals. Can I also add that uh, among the problems with captivity is that uh, one of, actually one of the important things we've really learned in the last 50 years about killer whales is just how exquisite this uh, sixth sense of theirs, the echolocation sense is. It's, it's, uh, it is actually apparently their primary uh, interface with the world and yet when you put, a, you put a killer whale in one of these plain concrete tanks, no matter how big it is, it's going to be the same as putting a human being into a plain white room. It's a form of sensory deprivation. There's no complexity uh, to their environment, which is kind of an essential feature for them uh, in terms of, of their, you know, just their sensory daily lives. And and you deprive them of that, it's it's really a, another form of, of, of deprivation and it is really bad on them mentally. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's a really good point because um, this actually applies to all cetaceans in captivity. They are, it's not that they don't use their echolocation or can't use their echolocation in a concrete tank. They can do both and they, and they do do both. But why? They actually do decrease their use of echolocation when they're in captivity. That's been examined and studied. The percentage of time that they spend using echolocation declines when they're in captivity. And it's not because, you know, particularly in, in more newly designed uh, enclosures, it's not because it's driving them mad. It's because they're living in a smooth-sided, shallow, clear-watered uh, box. So what, echolocation is overkill. It's an extremely sophisticated um, sense that we really can't comprehend, I think. Um, it's, not, it's probably even way better than ultrasound, but that's the, best we can, that's the best analogy we can use for it. And that's like, you know, why use that when there's no complexity, no change, no change? There's no change. Day to day, it's the same box, and there's nothing new in it. So why use this incredibly sophisticated sense? So they stop using it. This, this amazing sense that evolution has uh, adapted to this incredibly complex habitat that live out in the wild, they don't, they, they don't use it in captivity because why would they? Right. So I'd like to address something that was uh, submitted to us, another question. And we've been discussing marine mammals in captivity for entertainment purposes. But I'd like to ask, do you believe it's okay to keep them in captivity for research purposes or conservation purposes, rehabilitation, things like that? So the question I had submitted was, uh, in a recent address at the Society for Marine Mammalogy conference in San Francisco, uh, the presenter stressed the importance of laboratory and captive animal studies uh, for the development of our understanding of marine mammals. What are your thoughts on this? I don't believe that keeping these animals in captivity purely for research is either um, appropriate or necessary because 
um, again, just because you're keeping them for a different purpose doesn't mean that it makes it better for them in terms of their welfare. Their welfare will still suffer. So if you're talking about essential conservation research, then there will always be animals available that have stranded and can't be released into the wild and are then you know, held in captivity because um, they, they would die if you release them and, and there's some ethical concerns about that. So you try to give them, in my, in my opinion, we are, need to move toward trying to give them better circumstances and then those animals would be available for captive studies you know, into the future. Uh, it wouldn't be that many animals, but quite frankly, the animals that are performing aren't really available for research now. They're too busy being trained for the show. So, in fact, the accessibility of these animals to outside researchers, researchers who don't actually work for SeaWorld, um, is pretty minimal. Um, it's, it's an ongoing problem, and even those who support captive research have pointed it out, that they don't get access to these performance animals very often or often enough because they're busy being trained for performances. So the fact is, is that the current situation is these, you know, these 40 some odd killer whales that are available in, in the Western world and the hundreds of dolphins aren't really as available for research as you think they are. And, you know, if in fact we decided there was some benefit to captive research, which I believe there is some benefit to captive research, then stranded animals that can't be released to the wild will always be available in small numbers, but always be available. And so I don't see the need for sea worlds. I don't see the need for performance um, exhibits, you know, dolphinariums. I don't see the need for them for captive research. Well, and can I speak to what I saw, actually saw at SeaWorld based on what Naomi's saying? So in three and a half years, I saw one outside researcher, and he was at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium. His name was Dr. Frank Fish, so I won't forget his name too easily. And he did a research, his research project was on hydrodynamics. He was looking at how the water moved over the whale's pectoral flippers and over their bodies as they swam through the water. So what he did was he put a camera in front of the Whale and Dolphin Stadium, and he filmed the belugas and the false killer whales and the dolphins as they swam through the water. And I think that data was going to be used for the submarine industry. <laughs> it wasn't even benefiting the, again, it was, there was no benefit to, to wild animals. So that's one, and I know that, again, SeaWorld was doing research papers on uh, looking at, um, at changes in hormones in the female whales, trying to figure out when they were going into estrus so they could impregnate them. But again, I don't see that as anything benefiting the wild whales. But you have to look at what's going on right now in terms of the ethics of experimenting on animals right now. There's protests everywhere about everything from chimpanzees to rabbits. Um, we just heard that Ringling Brothers, you know, they're retiring their elephants and and now there's some word that they're going to be using those animals for cancer research and already people are getting upset about that so I don't I think that we're seeing that the um, the ethics of, of even researching these animals again what's the cost benefit analysis and I don't see the benefit and I see the animals suffering because we humans are saying oh well, well there's something that we can get out of them being in captivity but that's just not true well, and exactly what uh, Sam just said, um, in the 14 years that I had, 12 of which were at SeaWorld, uh, I only saw one study. So Sam t spoke about her one study, and I also only saw one study, and all the others that they speak about are exactly what she just stated. Um, they're about how they can continue to keep these animals in captivity and can continue to breed them in captivity and can, can continue to artificially inseminate them in captivity. It's nothing to do with uh, uh, true conservation and uh, saving these animals in the wild or populations in the wild. Um, and uh, the, I have a huge problem when I hear places like SeaWorld and other marine parks um, who are fighting now, they're being forced to fight on a legislative level uh, to try to stay in business, and I hear them argue, but we have to have, this is a paraphrase, but a near exact quote, but we have to have these animals in captivity because we don't know everything about them yet. I find that personally very offensive because what right do we have just because we want to know something about an animal does not mean that we have the right to keep them in captivity. You know, we, we um, um, you know, like Naomi said, if it, it's, it's different if they were stranded um, and you had those animals to study, but to to breed 
killer whales to inbreed them now and crossbreed them and for show purposes and to try to use that as an excuse of why you need more whales because there's more that you still need to learn about them I think is disgusting. You know, I, I, I think it would be great if, um, if they'd actually done research. You know, they've had these animals in captivity for 50 years now. And yeah, it would be great if they'd actually done some of the research on them that, you know, particularly on communications and echolocation that should have been done, that really could only be done on animals in captivity. But they haven't done this stuff. Uh, when I set out to research my book, I went and tried to find all of the extant published research on killer whales that I could find. And I collected, you know, two rather large thick books of, of published research and about that much of it <laughs> was from SeaWorld. Almost none of it. The vast, vast majority of what we know about killer whales is, is the product of uh, scientists who've worked with them in the wild and um, very, very little of it is a product of any kind of research that's done on uh, animals at SeaWorld because for exactly the reasons uh, Naomi points out that these animals are kept on too busy of a performance schedule to be any kind of worthwhile scientific research subjects. It's that simple. And I also want to point out that what you can get in the wild is, is not, SeaWorld will say that, oh, we can't study these animals in the wild, we can't get the information. Well, there's a, there's a study right now that's been done with whale poop, and, and, uh, and Naomi can speak to that. Um, you can actually get a lot of information. I had no idea that you can find out. Um, you don't, first of all, you don't have to stress the animals out by getting some kind of a tissue sample. You can actually trail a pod of whales. They've now trained a dog that can sniff out whale poop. They can collect that and they can tell, they can do DNA research. They can tell which animal it is, whether that animal is pregnant, whether that animal is an estrus. There's all this information that you can get without even harassing. You don't even have to see the whales and you can get this information. So again, it's kind of nuts to say that you can only get it from, from keeping animals in tanks. And, and one last thing, um, SeaWorld has in fact uh, started doing a few um, projects, uh, research projects with outside researchers who've agreed to work there um, in recent years, uh, and I mean like in the last three years, uh, metabolic, basal metabolic rate studies, um, heart rate studies and things like that. All of that's within the last three years, maybe four, and it's all in response. Thank to, you, Blackbirds. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in terms of what's happened in the last couple of years, that's in direct response to Blackfish. And it is in, also in response to, for example, Death at SeaWorld, which came out in 2012, um, the OSHA hearing, which was going on in 2011 and 2012. These are, it's reactive. They're actually trying to make reality fit their rhetoric. Look at the timing well, we, of all of these projects. Yeah, we had a question submitted online, and... Uh, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Aitor Suarez asked, can parks like SeaWorld or Marineland succeed without captive animals? I think they can. Look at the uh, incredible rides at uh, Universal Studios in Hollywood or Orlando. They have the most amazing, uh, uh, sophisticated, and technologically advanced rides. And um, they, um, I believe that they could bring these same people in, these same engineers, and create these rides that provide a completely immersive underwater experience where people could still learn about dolphins and orcas and other types of marine animals uh, and it not have to be where there are caged animals that have sacrificed their entire life so that you could have a a fun-filled day at SeaWorld or whatever other marine park and uh, you know and this is the 21st century and this is what kids want to ride on anyway that's why these these parks have these rides and they're doing so well financially where SeaWorld is not doing so well financially at all um, and I just think that that's the way they should go you know stop the breeding program let these animals be the last ones that um, are in captivity and let's focus on to these immersive experience, experiences and still continue to learn about the marine environment and these animals, but not have to cage animals to do so. 
Yeah, it's really simple. They can change their business model, and they've, they've been fighting for some reason to keep the same business model, and it just takes a little bit of creativity. I mean, I, you know, if you think about it for like five minutes, I'm sure if you took it to a class of like eighth graders, they could come up with four or five different ways that, that SeaWorld could make up something more entertaining without actually having whales and, and tanks. You know, one of the things that I thought about was there's hydrophones in the water all over the world. And so what you could do, you could even have, um, uh, you could have like a pavilion where there's an announcement over the park, uh, park uh, speaker system, like, well, now we're hearing whales in Australia, and you could go to the pavilion and listen to, or they could even pipe that sound through the park. Um, there's just so many creative things that we can do now with science and technology. There's a, um, there's a CGI underwater whale viewing thing invented by a, a Japanese company, and you can find it online. And, um, and they basically project CGI whales in a, in a dark room, like a theater. And I don't know how much that costs, but you know, let's say it's even a million dollars. That's not even a fraction of what SeaWorld's saying they were going to spend to expand their tanks in California. And when the kids are watching these whales on this screen in a dark room, it's kind of like they're watching them underwater. And not only do the kids get to interact with these CGI whales, but if you wanted to go a level further, let's say you wanted to do dissections, you could do CGI di dissections, and the kids could see what the inside of the whales look like. So there's all these cool things that you could do if you just think about it for five minutes. And for some reason, they're like holding on tightly to this business model that, that's dying, and they don't want to let go. And I don't understand it. I mean, basically, the um, Universal and um, Disney, you know, they have a never-ending supply of movies that they can then turn into rides and attractions. So you've got Frozen and Harry Potter and all that. Well, the ocean is marine, you know, SeaWorld's, you know, uh, playground as it were, you know, and so they can have a never-ending new supply of of attractions, immersive attractions that are marine themed, you know, with the Kraken, you know, or 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 giant squid, you know, which are a real animal or um, large whales, you know, you could go swimming with sperm whales. You know, if they if they did it right, if they did it technologically um, with cutting edge technology, I think that would be cool for kids. Kids would like that. It'd be a ride. It would be a theme park ride with a marine theme that didn't use any live animals. And and also on the conservation side, there was an. Um, I live outside of Anchorage, Alaska, and last year the the Anchorage Museum had this amazing exhibit devoted to plastic in the ocean. And they had all these artists come in and take the plastic and and make these incredible exhibits with it. And every single one was creative and unique. And it was so it really and and, and there were movies made out of it. And and there every single one was um, it, it spoke to different people. There was one woman who took all this plastic and she created an Iditarod dog team. Another woman created all these, took all these little plastics and put them in bags with labels like it was a gift that you could buy. Here's a gift from the ocean coming back to you. Um, and then there was a movie of these people who lived on an isolated island and you could see what the plastic had done to their lives over the, over the past 10 years. And, um, and so that's real conservation message and actually teaching kids about what's going on right now versus, um, you know, the, I think the conservation message that they have in the shows is somebody throws a piece of plastic in the water and a sea lion grabs it and they put it in the trash. <laughs> and that's about it. So, uh, th again, there's just so many things that they could be doing that they're not doing. Well, and the hugely successful and profitable business model of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, not only is it a beautiful facility, but it's uh, wildly financially successful. And um, it is... A, a, incredibly educational about marine life and they do not have any captive cetaceans at their facility and the facility is beautiful and and, and does very well and I, I think the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium is a, is a perfect example of a business model uh, that they could easily go to but like Sam says they just refuse they absolutely refuse to change their business model yeah as is noted in the comment section uh, also here in Maui, the Maui Ocean Center is a very successful aquarium that does not have any captive marine mammals. And I don't think we're saying, and I hope we're not saying, because I don't think it's fair, um, that they should become an aquarium, because that mm -hmm. isn't their business model. They are a theme park. Mm -hmm. But they are a marine theme park. That is their theme. <laughs> That's the whole point about having a theme park. It has a theme. Well, the theme for SeaWorld is the ocean. And that, like I said, there's always new things being learned about the ocean, about coral reefs, about whale sharks, about anything about, you know, um, conservation issues like microbeads and all of that. So they couldn't constantly have new rides as it is because they're insisting on this old business model. They don't have anything new. They just have the same old, same old. And that is actually hurting them in the business of theme parks. And uh, I don't really understand as much about that as I should probably, but I'm learning, and that's one of the things I've learned.
the reason Universal and Disney are so much more successful in Orlando is because they're always giving the customer something new. And if you look at also what's happening right now with SeaWorld, all the three SeaWorld parks, uh, the $70 million lifting floors that were put in um, uh, after Don's death, um, and the reason why is because SeaWorld was going to try to put their trainers back into the water. Of course, the courts prevented them from doing that. But now, uh, not only had the whales already destroyed the floors and the floors didn't work to begin with, but now SeaWorld is ripping out each of those $70 million lifting floors. And imagine um, all that money, potentially $210 million, what they could have done with that to truly provide an enriching life for these these animals that are still in captivity and maybe until the for the rest of their life if we stop the breeding program and these are truly the last the, or, the last orcas in captivity and what research could that money have funded 270 million dollars <laughs> I think about that for a moment it's amazing to, to think about and yet and what what do they do now they're just ripped out floors that never even worked properly to begin with so I'd like to get back to the question section. We've had a lot of submissions from the audience, and thank you all very much for submitting your questions. One that's gotten a lot of uh, upvotes is, uh, you mentioned how people should see these animals in the wild to understand them. How do you feel about the uh, tourism industry taking people out on boats to view these animals? Is there any negative side to that, such as noise? Yes. <laughs> there, is a, there is a downside to... Uh, Whale watching, um, it's it's a definitely a, a problem with, with uh, particularly with animals like killer whales and uh, anybody anything any animal that uses echolocation to hunt. Um, I think is problematic because uh, it it interferes with their ability to echolocate, their ability to find food. Uh, studies have also found that uh, some of these uh, whale watch boats uh, will force the animals to change their patterns of, of movement. Uh, when it comes to an endangered uh, population like the southern residents here in the Seattle area, uh, you know, that means that they're spending more energy uh, that, than they would have to be uh, to find food. And so, you know, it's a problem. Um, fortunately, I think there is going to be a lot more regulation of whale watching boats here in the uh, Puget Sound. Um, and it's probably necessary. Um, there are a lot of ethical uh, whale boats out there, but there are enough unethical ones that it becomes a problem. And then, you know, on certain summer days, you'll see 40, 50 boats around these pods out there. And, you know, that's just a problem for them. So um, it's, let's put it this way. Uh, seeing them in a boat is far superior to seeing them in a, in a concrete tank uh, but you need to choose wisely, you need to choose carefully, uh, and uh, be thoughtful. Uh, I, I think that it's actually, here in the San Juans, you can actually go see them from land very easily, and that's, I think, the best way to see them anyway. Uh, it's pretty astonishing sight. And, and let me just, uh, this is, is going to sound pretty rich coming from me, because I've spent a lot of time with these animals in the wild. I was privileged. It's not my right to see these animals in the wild. It was a privilege. And I was privileged, and so like I said, it might sound kind of rich coming from me, but you don't have a right to see every species of wildlife in the wild, or in captivity for that matter. You don't have the right to see every species you want to see up close and personal. Every time you are uh, given the privilege of doing that, it is, that is exactly what it is. And, and so in some cases, you are going to have to, you being the generic you out there in the whole wide world, um, are going to have to forego the experience of seeing these animals in the flesh, whether it's in captivity or in the wild. Your experience of these animals will be from books, from 3D uh, films, from IMAX, from CGI, from um, museums, and so on. And that is for the welfare of the animal and the health of the ecosystem. And if that doesn't concern you, um, that's a problem because, you know, you can have all of your other concerns. You can have your concerns about um, us, you know, human rights, um, you know, anything, you know, the banking war, anything you want. There are so many incredibly important 
issues for us to be concerned about. But if you don't have a healthy planet to live on to deal with all of those issues, game over. So the fact is, is that you need to a certain extent realize that nature has to be allowed to do its thing to keep the planet healthy without us constantly you know, um, having access to it. That's not necessarily going to be possible. You know, we are going to try our best to maximize, um, you know, that possibility um, with responsible whale watching, with, we hope, sanctuaries for former captive animals and so on. But in the end, somebody's going to have to make a sacrifice and not actually have up close and personal um, interaction with these animals. And um, as I said, it's kind of rich coming from me because it's not going to be me. I've already had my um, experience with them. But, you know, I don't go out very often anymore. In fact, I, I haven't been out on the water in a couple of years now, and I really try to minimize how often I do because it's not the solution. I'm not arguing that everybody should be able to go whale watching because I'm trying to take SeaWorld away from them. The fact is, is that some of us you know, are not going to have access to these animals at all for their benefit, for their welfare. Well, and that's oh, why I, I feel, I'm sorry, Sam. Okay, um, that's why I feel, you know, it's the incredible arrogance of the human race to feel uh, in the captive industry to plead so passionately their case of why they must have cetaceans in captivity because we have not learned everything that we have uh, yet, you know, we haven't learned everything that we need to learn about them yet. And again, it comes down to what right do you have to imprison and enslave these animals because you want to learn something about them. You do not have that right. That is an absolute arrogant um, frame of mind, and it's uh, you know clearly evident by the captive industry. And and again, it's a it's such a human centric. Um, uh, perception here when we're talking about wanting to see these animals in the wild or wanting to get up close and personal and um, you know I'm echoing Naomi on this one you know coming from me who I did get a chance to swim with killer whales and I swam with dolphins in captivity and it was at a point in my life it was my dream to do that and I felt really like it was something special and I love the whales so I thought that they wanted to swim with me too but the truth is, is that they don't <laughs> you know it's not for that we're doing it it's very selfish it's very selfish behavior like I want I need I have to have and when you take away that human-centric perspective and you realize that when you choose not to do that you're actually helping them more than by going to see them in the wild. There's so many things that you can do that don't involve actually touching a whale or seeing a whale and you probably would be making a big, bigger difference in their lives. We've had a number of questions submitted now from different people uh, about the animals that are already in captivity and they'd like you to discuss what we should do with these animals. Can they be released into the wild? Are sea fins a viable alternative? If they can't be released, what should happen to them? Um, so, yeah, the, the solution. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If we are going to end, over time, the um, public display of these animals, um, what about the ones that are currently living in, in captivity? What, what's their future? And so what we're working towards is a whole group of us in the um, animal advocacy and science communities that are working towards... Um, developing sanctuaries. So this is not a marine sanctuary in the sense of a protected area for an entire ecosystem. This is in fact a captive enclosure. This is some sort of sea pen that would keep the animals in, um, but it would provide them with a more natural, um, uh, uh, more natural conditions. Uh, acoustically, um, particularly, it would be more natural for them. Um, it would be larger because it, in an engineering sense you can give them more space when you're Leaving, when you're using natural habitat as your substrate because you don't have to dig a hole and fill it with concrete and all of these things that become engineering um, obstacles when you're actually building an artificial enclosure. Um, there will be challenges, legal, logistical, infrastructural, financial, um, but it's, it, it's doable because um, we have done it at least two or three times before, not necessarily um, with great success, but that's more because of uh, people... <laughs> being what they are in politics, not because of the logistics of it. And so I think now that we've got enough political will, because that's what we didn't have before, um, that a sanctuary is very near. We are going to have a functioning um, both warm water and cold water sanctuary for cetaceans that have been retired from performance in captive facilities sooner than later. And that is what we are offering. 
That is what we are trying to work toward because we are, in fact, working towards closing the show. So these animals will live out their lives uh, in human care, as the industry calls it, and we need to do um, as best we can by them, and so that's what we're working towards. Well, and, you know, we those whales need the human care because they have been so damaged by captivity. So, you know, the issue about putting these animals into a sea sanctuary is not, you know, because I hear these questions and these arguments a lot, is it, oh, well, would the whales know how to learn to catch fish? Would they, uh, you know, be traumatized by their environment? This is their natural habitat. This is where they lived at, for tens of millions of years. I mean, we took them out of their natural habitat and put them into small concrete enclosures. If people don't think that that was stressful and yet those animals adapted to that environment, why, could, why would you possibly think that they could not be reacclimated back into their natural habitat where all their natural instincts would come back into play? The question comes down to is how damaged have each of these individual whales, and it would be individual specific. There would be some whales that would be much stronger and more viable candidates than others. Naomi knows this. There, there's, there's always going to uh, be the case. There are some animals that in captivity that have been historically sick their entire captive lives. Others, not as much. There are other animals that have completely destroyed their teeth, and most of their teeth have been drilled out in popotomies. And we have other whales that that's not the case. Even though they've worn them down, they haven't had to endure any of the popotomies. So there are different types like that, but it comes down to how damaged have they been by captivity will depend on how viable they are for acclimation back into their natural habitat and even for potentially a full release. Uh, with, you know, a, a lot of other factors that will go into play for that. Okay, so I had a good question here from a couple of different people, but I'll ask it from Holly in the UK. And she's asked, orcas have received a lot of the media attention, particularly since they're releasing blackfish, but how does this translate into emotions being set into place for other species, such as belugas and other dolphin species? Very good question. And again, um, I'll start because I've been doing this for 23 years. I keep saying that, sorry. Um, it's been a long time. Um, and we, I've always worked on all species, belugas, bottlenose dolphins, in fact, all marine mammals trying to improve their welfare in captivity. It's been a, a lifelong campaign for me. And so uh, we are, in fact, still very much focused on the welfare of of other cetacean species. The reason orcas are getting all the press right now is one, blackfish. Two, um, they are the largest cetacean that's held in captivity and so based on their size alone they are the least suited um, to being confined in a small space. But all cetaceans have welfare problems. All of them are being compromised in some fundamental way for all of the reasons we've already discussed for orcas specifically. Echolocation, the, 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 the incredibly poverty-stricken nature of their environment in captivity, the smooth concrete walls, the boring enclosures, that's all, that's as much a problem for a bottom-nosed dolphin as it is for an orca. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, um, what can members of the public do about this issue, aside from not visiting these captive facilities? What are some actual steps that the public can take to help? From my perspective, this entire the situation is moving at warp speed. I know a lot of people who've joined the um, movement more recently because of Blackfish and so on think things are taking forever. I laugh whenever I hear that because where we were in 2010 on February 23rd was light years um, in the past compared to where we are now. And so to me, things are moving so fast my head is spinning. Um, what people can do is what is really driving this entire warp speed progress, which is word of mouth, social media, grassroots, people just talking about this. Um, when you're sitting on the plane and you start chatting with their neighbor, bring up Blackfish, you know, have they seen it? They should see it. Um, don't go around proselytizing people and telling them, don't buy a ticket, and don't, you know, criticize them if they have bought a ticket. Try to educate. 
you know, and just talk and spread the message through, you know, all of these incredible avenues that we have now, like social media. I don't know that we would be moving at quite the speed we're moving um, if this had happened in 1990 because we didn't have social media then. People hear about things so instantly now. So talk, 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 talk. They'll hear. Well, and you know, back to something you had said earlier, and it was either Sam or Naomi or both, but you know, it's, it's on such an intuitive level with people uh, just by speaking with them about this issue. You don't really have to give them a lot of information for people to get it. You know, even if they had just visited a, a marine park the day before, but you're having a casual conversation with them and you bring up these issues, a light bulb immediately goes off and they say, yes, that actually makes perfect sense. And, you know, now I wish I hadn't gone. And I tell them, don't feel bad about having gone in the past. We've all done it. I did it. I, I had a career out of it. But now you know it's about being educated and you know sending that message forward. And I just gave a lecture at Georgetown University, and what really struck me was that you know of course these kids are brilliant at Georgetown University. You know they're so smart and uh, so well educated. And uh, before even my lecture, none of them were for captive uh, animals, especially for the entertainment industry. They all immediately got that this was morally and ethically unacceptable and then of course after my lecture they were even more so but what what stood out to me about it is is that this generation this new educated generation they get it they get it and 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 they they get it on a fundamental level it's not even a question mark for them so i think the where where we need to get the outrage outreach or to the people who are not as fortunate with the education and the Georgetown University uh, um, you know schooling and, uh, and and hit those areas of people that don't have that level of access to, to education and information and inform those people. I think uh, Luis Sahoyas, director of the Cove and, and the new movie Racing Extinction, he says basically what are you good at? Do that. So if you're good at talking to people, you know, just talk to people about the issue. Like Naomi said, if, if what you like is social media, you can post info on social media. I actually live in a, in a small state where we have access to, um, we know some of the local politicians. So if you have connections and you have local politicians and you can, um, and you can get legislation, you know, get, um, get the information out there on a the legislation level, that's great. I mean, in Washington State right now, there's legislation that's on the table. To um to end cetacean captivity, so um so and it was citizen there, it was citizen driven. Yeah, that that bill was introduced by a, a woman who's just a regular citizen. Right. So so that's that's somebody making a change. This is grassroots. So really, just starting to talk about it, starting to educate yourself. There's a great new movie out about the Vancouver Aquarium that looks behind the scenes at the Vancouver Aquarium belugas. And I had no idea what what went on there and how they got their belugas and the connection to SeaWorld. And and I've been doing this for six years, so I learned a lot just just watching that movie. So there's so much information out there, and just getting informed and educated, and then sharing it with people, and you're going to make those connections, and 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 you'll see things changing just from that. Naomi's right that I actually have somebody had sent. Me a clipping a story about Corky from 1993 when I was still employed at SeaWorld and I saved it and I found it um, shortly after Don Branchow's death in, in February 2010 and it's the same story about Corky's capture and what she's endured in captivity and that was from 1993 and her life hasn't changed and that information was all out there in the newspapers in 1993 but nothing happened and now because of social media and, and Blackfish and all the books and all the movies and all the, the grassroots work, I mean, things are changing and, and it's amazing how fast it's going, actually. And, and there, there is legislation right now that, that people can get behind. I hope it's, uh, people understand that uh, Congressman Adam Schiff has, uh, has produced uh, national legislation that's now going, uh, working its way through the House of Representatives. Um, there is legislation being worked up in California. Uh, additionally, the California Coastal Commission recently handed down a ruling that uh, ordered uh, SeaWorld essentially to end its breeding programs. Uh, that commission is now under fire uh, from development interests, and a lot of that is believed to be actually fueled by the folks from SeaWorld. So, uh, you know, if you want to get involved, there's plenty for people to do just on the sort of political scale in terms of political activism, 
uh, get out and back that legislation uh, that's whatever's in your state as well as nationally and definitely back entities like the CCC. So I'm going to just make a, make a suggestion. Because the Washington bill was, in fact, um, citizen-driven, if you are a citizen of a state and you have any connection whatsoever or any interest in getting a connection whatsoever to a legislator, you know, your own, leg your own representative or assemblyman or whatever it would be in your state, see if you can't get a bill passed in your state to prohibit the public display of Orcas or all cetaceans, the uh, Washington Mills all cetaceans. Even if there aren't any in your state, if you're in Iowa, trust me, there are no whales or dolphins in captivity in Iowa. But and, and, I mean, there really aren't. So there could be, but there just aren't. So um, if you live in Iowa and you want to get a bill passed that would prohibit it, it, it should be politically rather easy, um, and it, it can make a statement. It can. If we get that kind of bill passed in all 50 states, then Representative Adam Schiff's bill immediately becomes moot, quite frankly. But, you know, we're going to keep working on um, Mr. Schiff's bill as well. So, you know, there are so many ways you can get, get a resolution passed in your city, just in your municipality. Get a, get a resolution passed that, you know, Blackfish was a, was a strong film and, and you believe that whales and dolphins don't belong in captivity. Malibu has done that. Other right. uh, San Francisco has done that. New York, that. yeah, New York. So, so just York. go ahead and and whatever. Get involved in your government. You know, we live bizarrely enough. We do actually live in a democracy, and it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. And so get involved and get politically active. So whenever I hear, what can we do? You know, I'm just one person. What can we do? Well, you know, as Margaret Mead said, you know, real change has never happened other than one person at a time. That's how it happens, is one person decides to make a change. And real quick, I want to say, I have personally seen, and I know everyone else has also, uh, on social media, there are a number of incredible people that have done so much work to spread awareness and education about this issue. It blows me away when I hear how hard they work. I mean, some of these people work literally through the day and night to spread uh, the awareness and education from Blackfish, from our books, from upcoming legislation, and um, I'm blown away by their passion and um, and how energized they are because they are doing some real fantastic hard work that that doesn't necessarily get the same exposure or recognition from those of us that are you know more active in the media and you know people are used to seeing our faces but these people are working just as hard as we are and and believe in the cause just as as much as we do and, and are fighting and I just want to say thank you to all of those people because I have personally seen it and been blown away by it so thank you very much yeah, since we're talking about the uh, legality of marine mammals in captivity I uh, just want to point out that uh, it's illegal in Maui County to have marine mammals in captivity. Not the entire state of Hawaii, but Maui County does have a law against it. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask, what are the current uh, laws federally about marine mammals in captivity? And we have a question also submitted by Calypso Maiden, and it says, are there any bills on the table to stop the breeding of cetaceans in marine parks? So I'll handle that because that's what I do. I, I work in policy. Um, so there are a number of things going on. There are two states that are considering bills to prohibit the public display of all cetaceans in Washington and just orcas in California. And they will also ban the breeding. I mean, the whole point is to end um, the public display, so you have to stop the breeding program to do that. Both of those bills would result in a phase-out, not a complete, you know, all of them get dumped back into the ocean tomorrow kind of situation. They will. The current existing animals would be grandfathered in. They would be allowed to stay where they are, although we would work to continue to retire them. But they would not be bred, and they couldn't be in performances. So their public display in the sense of these circus shows would end, and they wouldn't be bred anymore. Um, imports, exports would end as well. They couldn't acquire any more animals. There's also a national bill, as David pointed out. Um, it's H.R. 4019. It's the ORCA Act, the ORCA Responsibility and Care Advancement Act. I love the way politicians do that. Um, it's a great acronym. Um, and so the ORCA Act would uh, ban the public display, breeding, import, and export of um, orcas nationally. So all of the parks that display um, orcas would be affected by that 
that bill if it passes. There's also a regulatory process being uh, undertaken right now. It's not a bill. There's already a, a, a statute, the Animal Welfare Act, that um, governs the care and maintenance of these uh, of these animals when they're in captivity, and they are amending, they are updating the regulations that uh, address the care and maintenance of captive marine mammals. Um, the proposed rules, it's called, which is um, lengthy and has a number of different uh, changes to the provisions, um, is very poor, it's very weak, and um, we need to work during the public comment period. Again, your government, democracy, it's transparent, you have input, so get involved, comment on this um, proposal because it, it's very weak and it needs to be stronger. There will be action alerts coming from a number of nonprofit organizations, animal groups, over the course of the next couple of three weeks or so um, because we have a 60-day, a, a two-month public comment period that ends on April 4th. We're also asking for an extension, but we may not get it, so April 4th is the date you need to keep in mind as the deadline for comments on this proposed rule. So this is, again, a regulatory process to update the care and maintenance regulations that um, govern how places like SeaWorld keep whales and dolphins in captivity, and they, the proposal is very weak. We need to strengthen it. And these proposed bills to end or, uh, the captivity of orcas for entertainment and also for, uh, uh, br of course, breeding, number one, and the transport of killer whales across state lines also affects the genetic material across state lines. Uh, that way that artificial insemination would also be stopped as well. Yeah. The breeding program all across the board, regardless of how you breed them, would end. Yeah. Okay, so we have a very interesting question here submitted by Taylor Day. And Taylor asked, would you argue that captivity is wrong for all animal species or just highly intelligent species, such as cetaceans, elephants, primates, in terms of zoological conservation for species that are close to extinction? Um, I would say there's definitely yeah, some animals that do not. Yeah. Yeah, they just don't do well in captivity. Killer whales, all cetaceans, you know, you can take them out. <laughs> Elephants, tigers, lions, bears, all large animals. We know we can't meet their needs in captivity. Um, I'd say there are certain animals that, you know, like I've seen, I've seen otters in large enclosures <clears throat> in facilities where I'm not sure those animals don't know that they're, um, that they're not out in the wild. There are some smaller species that, that do well. Um, I, again, I would I would look at each individual um, zoo and marine park and look at what they're doing and why they're doing it because I think that um, that there are there are there are some, there's some benefit I think to, to these animals, but I'm really questioning it a lot more than I used to. I used to think that it, it was a um, it was like oh no, there's definitely a benefit to having animals in in captivity. But now I'd have to say you have to look at each individual zoo and each individual animal and see what's going on and what they're actually doing. And I think that I will find the more we look in, more of this issue is looked into. Let's say we were able to to eliminate cetacean captivity and lions and tigers and bears and primates. Um, I think that we'll find that there are other animals that, that we don't think are suffering in captivity are still are still suffering in, in captivity. So um, you know, if we could we could move to a, a much different model in in teaching kids and not not expecting kind of goes back to what Naomi was saying earlier about we don't necessarily we don't have a right to see these guys in captivity anymore. We don't have a right to do things the way we've always been doing it. And I think we want to look at the bigger picture about how what we're doing does it benefit. The environment does it benefit the planet? Does it benefit future generations? So I think it's it's really up in the air for me in a way that it wasn't when I certainly when I first got into the industry and now. So I think you'd have to look at, at each individual place and, and the and the individual animals and how they're being taken care of. I think for me personally, um, uh, I, I don't like seeing any caged animals for any other purpose than the preservation of the species. If um, these animals needed to be in captivity because they were uh, becoming extinct and we were trying to uh, preserve them in true conservation, I think that that has a, a valid place. I think anything other than that uh, is exploitation of the animals for profit and um, I don't feel good about it and I don't like to see it. I don't like to see um, animals caged up and essentially their freedom taken away from them. So that's how I feel on it at this point. I mean I really think that exhibits like in that, that are, you know in zoos and aquariums um, need to demonstrate that they're actually having a positive impact on the public to conserve natural habitat because that's what the point is supposedly 
um, they, all of the professional associations for zoos and aquariums now claim that their purpose is to, to conserve the animals in the wild. So are they? Are they actually furthering that goal? Um, so that's one thing. There has to be some, the conventional wisdom can't just be accepted at face value anymore. There has to be some metric that measures whether they're actually accomplishing that goal. I think the animals deserve that. They deserve proof <laughs> that if they're being incarcerated, there's a reason for it and there's a value to it and there's actual progress being made. And then in addition, as Sam said, each uh, species has a different ecology. And so can they? Can they even adapt to confinement? There are a whole bunch of, of, of species now that we've got a growing body of research on, a welfare research on, to indicate that they don't ever adapt to confinement. They cannot thrive in confined spaces. And size is one factor, but wide-ranging habits in their, in their natural habitat is another factor. Actually, there are some species that are relatively large but have very small um, natural habitat ra home ranges that do okay in captivity but um, okay is relative so you know you really do have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis you have to uh, I think develop metrics to demonstrate that you are actually benefiting the animals in the wild there can be no there's no place in society now for having wildlife in confinement just for our entertainment there's no place in society for that anymore. Okay, good. Um, so we had a question from Kathleen in the UK, and she asked, how can the current boom for captive cetaceans in Asia be stopped, particularly um, the captive mm -hmm. orcas and belugas in Russia? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, wow. Great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, that is the new frontier for this campaign. Um, I've actually found over the years that um, a couple of times we've just exported our problem. We've we've made progress in the in in the U.S. or in North America, only to find that it's actually still a huge problem or a growing problem in you know another region. Um, so we just exported it because, in fact, a lot of the um, uh, customer base for that new area of ex exploitation is often Americans, um, and so uh, that's not true in China. Uh, it, the, the customer base in China is Chinese, is China, you know, are, is Chinese citizens, um, and they are probably about where um, North American citizens were about 50 to 60 years ago in terms of their knowledge base. So uh, a, a group of NGOs, including my own, have started a new campaign in China called the China Cetacean Alliance, and we will be trying to raise public awareness and bring um, the Chinese populace to. Um, the uh, the level that uh, the North American and European populace is at in terms of awareness. So that's a huge task. Um, China's a huge country and um, they are at a, a remarkable level of ignorance and I don't mean that pejoratively, I just mean they do not know. Um, they are not aware. And um, it's tricky to work in China because of its government. So we are going to do our best to raise public awareness there. Okay, great. Um, I think we've lost John because he had to go. He had a, yeah, yeah. I, I know we're getting close to the end of our time here. Oh, and I actually do want to add something to what Naomi was saying because both of us were in were in Singapore last year, and um, and we were censored <laughs> by the government. We were interviewed by one of the news stations there because we were there specifically to talk about the aftermath of blackfish and cetaceans in captivity, and um, and that interview did not make it onto the TV station in Singapore. So, um, so that's one of the issues with uh, with a more repressive government, and and so just again back to what Naomi said about here is that we do have a democracy and we do have a voice, and that was surprising to me. I had never been censored before, and and there was actually there was actually a little bit of concern even about us being there and doing our talk because there was representatives from the from the parks that we had visited earlier in that day, and they were listening very closely to what we were saying, and there were ties between the parks and the governments because you know it's a money making organization. So, um, so don't take what we have here for granted. Absolutely. Okay. Um, John's back. <laughs> yeah, John's back. Hi, guys. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any concluding remarks from anyone before I wrap things up? Um, no, no. Just thanks. <laughs> yeah. It, thanks you know, for having us here. I think it's a great. These sorts of discussions are, are what we've been talking about in terms of outreach. Education, raising public awareness, 
you guys are doing your part. Thank you very much. Well, oh, and well. I'd like to say that, you know, for all of us on this panel, uh, it feels um, so great for me that we're all working together because we, we do come from all uh, diverse backgrounds. And um, just speaking for myself, at one time we were uh, on opposite sides of this argument, and it feels good for me to, um, for us all to be together and working together, united to end this because we have to be united to to win this battle and for and to give justice for these captive animals, and we're doing that, and we've succeeded. And before, when we were a divided group, um, it was not nearly as strong or powerful. And I feel great where things are now. So um, I, I I love being associated with everybody on this panel. Thanks, John. And Thank I, you, John. I want to echo what what Naomi was saying about. Um, just about what you can do as an individual. I think that's really important to go back to. And I see, I see this issue in some ways. There are so many things that we could be focusing on in the world right now. And I have had people say, well, why whales in captivity? And I feel like from what I've seen from, um, from traveling all over the world with blackfish, that this issue is in some ways, it's a, it's a, I hate to say this, but gateway drug. <laughs> it, it opens people's hearts and minds to seeing about what's going on in the environment and they start to question. I mean, this is, this is a few corporations. This is, a, this is a small issue. There's only, what are we, at 47? Um, I can't remember what the number is. It's actually 57 now. 57. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a small number of killer whales in captivity. It requires money. It requires time. But it's a solvable issue. And I think that people, get, um, people can get inspired by seeing that this is changing and it is, there is some movement happening. And then people think, well, OK, if we can change this, what else can we do? So I feel like there's, there's something about this issue that um, every time I went to a screening of Blackfish and listened to the questions that the audience were asking and, and, the, and, and watching just people wake up about their environment and thinking like, wow, okay, what can I do? And then what else can I do? Um, it's just been really inspiring. So um, I'm, I'm, I just love participating in these kinds of discussions just to see where it takes people because often I hear two or three years later um, I get a note on Facebook that something I said to somebody um, comes back in a way that I, I wouldn't have thought about it what it what it's changed for their lives and what it's opened up for them. Yeah, the issues that we have to confront when we confront issue the issue of captivity for orcas as well as the issues of their long-term survival really are the same issues we have to confront when we think about our long-term survival as a species. Um, and I just put it very simply, you know, we save the whales, we save ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. So on behalf of Pacific Whale Foundation, I would like to extend a huge thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. And to those of you who tuned in in the audience, thank you for joining us. And thank you for submitting all your questions. We had fabulous questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to address them all. Um, so thank you to our panelists for your expertise and for working so tirelessly on this issue. We really appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. All right. Bye. And this Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. See you soon.